сегодня у нас очень замечательный день. И это не потому, что сегодня первый день зимы, а потому, что у нас в гостях два уникальных человека. Это профессор английской литературы господин Хэммонд и переводчик английской литературы поэт, музыкант и человек воистину ренессансных возможностей и талантов Андрей Качевский. <плодисменты> Профессор Хэммонд — человек, который за свою жизнь провел очень много времени в разных архивах, в поисках уникальных документов. И прежде всего, его одним из самых важных открытий была пьеса Falsehood, которую можно перевести как «двойное вероломство». Это текст, который был переработан в XIX веке, и господин Хэммонд вам расскажет уникальные детективные почти истории по поводу того, как он обнаружил этот текст, как он вычленял, собственно, шекспировский текст из переработки XIX века. Господин Хэммонд родился в прекрасном портовом шотландском городе Глазго, получил образование в университете Глазго и Оксфорде. Свою жизнь он преподавал английскую литературу со времен Шекспира и его современников и до наших дней. Please welcome, Mr. Professor Hammond. Перевод на русский язык вышел буквально недавно. Сейчас он был, сегодня он будет буквально через час представлен на э, выставке Nonfiction. Поэтому всем рекомендую э, читать этот перевод в, в исполнении господина Корчевского. Sometimes people think of William Shakespeare as a, as a genius, a solitary figure, sitting in a, an attic somewhere and, and uh, making dramatic and literary masterpieces. But increasingly people are coming to think of Shakespeare differently. Uh, we think of him now increasingly as a professional playwright, somebody who wrote for money, somebody who worked in the way that most playwrights worked at his time. Very quickly, collaboratively, and with the demands of the professional theater in mind. I could make this point by asking uh, you a quiz question. Uh, in England, we have pubs. I think in Russia, maybe you have pubs also. <laughs> But in England, we ha you have pubs. And it's a, a very common thing to go to the pub and to have a quiz. People get very competitive about these quizzes, and there's usually a small cash prize. Uh, it's not worth winning, but nevertheless, people get very, very, very competitive. So here's a question in the pub. We're all sitting in the pub. We've got a pint, and we're happy. Um, how many plays did William Shakespeare write? The answer to that question is much more difficult than you might expect. If you look at the first folio, this is the collection of plays that was, that was first created in 1623, seven years after Shakespeare's death. His two actor friends, John Hemming and Henry Condell, collected his plays together and they published them in this first folio edition. If you happen to find one of these, don't cut it up, don't give it away, because it's worth a lot of money. So there are... In that collection, there are 36 titles. About 50 years later, Nicholas Rowe collected Shakespeare in 1709, and there are 43 plays in, in that collection, including several plays here that you probably don't recognize as, as Shakespeare's at all. For example, the play Locrine. You've never heard of that as a Shakespeare play. London Prodigal. Have you ever heard of that as a Shakespeare play? Probably not. Uh, uh, so until very recently, the standard edition of Shakespeare had 36 plays, plus two more, which we now think Shakespeare wrote, but were not in the first folio. One is called Pericles, and the other one is called The Two Noble Kinsmen. Both of these plays were written with other people. Pericles with uh, John, uh, uh, George Wilkins, 
and the two noble kinsmen with John Fletcher, a man that we're going to come back to in this lecture. However, if we move on to the year 2017 and take a look at the new Oxford Shakespeare, published this year, you will find that it lists 45 plays. We've got to 45 now. And some of these, again, are very unfamiliar. Arden of Faversham, Edward III, uh, Sir Thomas More. These are all plays which we now think Shakespeare had at least a hand in, though he probably didn't write all of any of them. Uh, this here is a page from the play Sir Thomas More. And it, uh, it's sometimes called Hand D, because in that play there are more than four writers. Five people collaborated to write this play. But this, we think, is the only surviving example of William Shakespeare's handwriting, apart from signatures on documents. And we think that because of the formation of the P's, the letter P, in, in, in this uh, in particular. So we believe then that Shakespeare wrote some part of Sir Thomas More. And it so happens that that play has the only surviving example uh, of Shakespeare's handwriting. So what you're getting from me, I hope, is a sense that Shakespeare, unlike the way he was seen in the Romantic period, is not a solitary genius sitting up there in lonely splendor creating masterpieces. Uh, and if you look at the new Oxford uh, uh, 2017 edition, you also find that Shakespeare revised a number of his plays. Uh, it's often thought that Shakespeare was a, a one-take man, if, to, to put it in film, in film terms. He did it all in one take. He sat down and he wrote King Lear and there it was. Now we think not. Now we think that he actually worked hard, possibly revising, possibly changing the plays that he wrote. And there is evidence in Hamlet, in Othello, in, 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 uh, in Lear, of, of considerable revision to Shakespeare's texts. So, okay, the Shakespeare I'm trying to create for you is a Shakespeare who wrote with other people, who sometimes changed and revised and altered his plays, uh, and who is not perhaps uh, the person that, that we thought perhaps that he was. Well, I'm interested in one of these plays in particular. If you look at the New Oxford 2017 edition, you will find a play mentioned called Cardenio. Cardenio. Who's heard of Cardenio? Cardenio is a play that we don't know very much about because it has been lost. It was lost. Uh, hold on, I want that. We know that Cardenio existed because there are account documents. These documents register payments to Shakespeare's acting company for a play called Cardeno or Cardena, sometimes called Cardeno, sometimes Cardena. But because this document exists, and it is in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, because it exists, we know that Shakespeare must have written a play based on uh, a story from Don Quixote uh, by Cervantes, uh, the Cardenio story from Don Quixote, if you know that text. Don Quixote, of course, was the literary sensation of its age. It was published in 1605, and then it was made into English around about 1607, and finally published in English in 1612. It was very exciting. Everybody was very excited by Don Quixote, and in particular, the playwrights were very excited. And I see it like this. Uh, Shakespeare in 1607-1608 has had a very long career. He's getting tired. He's looking for new stuff. What can I do that's new? Uh, and am I going to do it? I need a collaborator. I need a younger man. I need a writer to write with me who is fresh, energetic, and who will do all the work. All I need to do is do the thinking. So, uh, John Fletcher, of course, is that man. Fletcher knows Spanish. He's a, he's a good Spanish speaker. He reads Spanish. He's read Don Quixote, and he's very excited about it. And he says to Shakespeare, William, 
I've got a play for you, and that is a play based on the Cardenio story. Some years later, 1610, 1611, they produce the play Cardenio. And it gets acted, but then it disappears. For some reason, it does not get collected into the first folio. Uh, and it seems to go under the radar, we might say. So let's go forward uh, 40 years to the year 1653. I've already told you that in 1612, 1613, there is documentary evidence of the Cardenio play. 1653, this man, Humphrey Mosley, who is a bookseller and publisher, uh, enters into the stationer's register, which is, that's the document that, that preserves copyright. If you want to protect your copyright in the 17th century, you put it in the stationer's register, which means, this is mine. Don't touch it. So in 1653, we see uh, the history of Cardenio. You can see it there. Uh, and if, if you could look further along, it says, by Mr. Fletcher and Shakespeare. So in 1653, we still have evidence uh, that the Cardenio play exists and that there is a literary property um, corresponding to it. Um, so. Uh, uh, we, we still uh, know that the play is lying around somewhere. There are other pieces of evidence that the play was still extant uh, before and after this, but they get very technical and I'm not going to go into them uh, at the moment. I'm going to cut forward to the year 1719. In the year 1719, there is a strange uh, prose work called The Postman Robbed of His Mail by Charles Gilden. And Charles Gilden, in that work, talks about a Shakespeare play which has been found, but which the London theatre management at Drury Lane will not perform. For some reason, they won't act it. Maybe because they don't really believe it's by Shakespeare. Who knows? But uh, this is what Gilden says. And you can hear in what I'm going to read that he's getting very angry. He's getting very angry. A valuable jewel lately brought to them by a friend of mine that might have had a chance of obliging the town with a noble diversion. I mean a play written by Beaumont and Fletcher and the immortal Shakespeare in the maturity of his judgment a few years before he died. A piece so excellent that a gentleman who is allowed a master of the stage tells me that after reading it seven times, it pleased and transported him, and that it's far beyond any of the college poets and inferior to few of the other poets which are in print. There is infallible proof that the copy is genuine, yet this rarity, this noble piece of antiquity, cannot make its way to the stage, because a person that is concerned in it is a person who of all persons, Mr. Sibber does not approve. Mr. Sibber is the manager of Drury Lane Theatre, and he is suppressing the play. He won't perform it. And Gildon is furious. They have a Shakespeare play, a new one, and Drury Lane won't perform it. So, in the same, at the same time, 1718, 1719, there is evidence that the Humphrey Mosley copyrights were sold again to the uh, main Shakespeare publisher of the 18th century, Jacob Tonson. This is a document which is a, 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 a purchase document. And again, you can see up at the top, the history of Cardenio by Fletcher and Shakespeare. And this is the year 1718. So it, in 1718, it seems reasonable to suppose that the play was still around, that Jacob Tonson bought it, bought the copyright to it, from uh, Mosley, and that Charles Gildon knew that that play existed and wished to have it performed. So, uh, cut forward to 1727. Let's go 10 years on. 10 years on, the, Sh the Shakespearean scholar Louis Theobald says, I have a new play by Shakespeare. I have it in my hand. 
and, uh, uh, and by this time, the Drury Lane Theatre are prepared to perform it. They've become convinced that Theobald is telling the truth, that he has a Shakespeare play. Theobald publishes, the play is acted, the play is successful, everybody enjoys it, the word of mouth is very positive, and so Theobald rushes into print. This is a royal license. This is at the beginning of the published edition, and it says that King George believes that this is um, a, a literary uh, jewel, a literary rarity that Theobald has found. Now, Theobald is a lawyer. If he has forged a play, is he going to get the king? Is he going to get the king's license behind it? Well, that could be dangerous. I don't, I don't, I don't think he's going to do that. I think uh, he's not as stupid as that. So, here's the play, here's its title page, Double Falsehood or the Distressed Lovers, a play as it is acted in the Theatre Royal in Drury Lane, written originally by W. Shakespeare and now revised and adapted to the stage by Mr. Theobald. Then we have a motto from Virgil, uh, a Latin motto, and that says, uh, what none of the gods would have dared promise to your prayers, see, rolling time has brought unasked. In other words, he gets Virgil to say that uh, the gods have given us a gift. We have a gift from the gods. And this is a new play by William Shakespeare, uh, adapted, adapted uh, by Theobald. Well, Theobald goes on to tell us a little bit about the play. He writes uh, a preface, and he says, one of the manuscript copies which I have is above 60 years standing, 60 years old, in the handwriting of Mr. Downes, the famous old prompter. And as I am credibly informed, was early in the possession of the celebrated Mr. Betterton, and by him designed to have been ushered into the world. Here Tybalt is telling us that He's got several copies of this, manuscript copies of it. One of them is 60 years old, he says. He says it's in the handwriting of John Downes, who really existed, and that it was owned by the celebrated Shakespeare actor, Thomas Betterton. So he's giving us its credentials. He's showing us its provenance. He's saying to people, don't think this is fake, because it isn't. I've got manuscripts, and they come from Betterton, the famous Shakespeare actor himself. He goes on to tell us that Shakespeare wrote the play uh, at a very late stage in his life, uh, just as he was going to retire, and he wrote it as a gift for his natural daughter, i.e. bastard daughter. Now, did Shakespeare have a bastard daughter? Shakespeare scholars will tell us, of course, he didn't. He had two daughters, but they were both legitimate, and he did not have a third daughter. However, Nicholas Rowe, in his account of the life of William Shakespeare, tells us that Shakespeare had three daughters. He doesn't talk any further about it, but he tells us that Shakespeare had three daughters. So, uh, maybe it's not so stupid. Maybe, maybe People always laugh at this, that Shakespeare had a natural daughter. Maybe he did. Anyway, um, uh, he goes on to talk about the other copies that he possesses and uh, things go quite well for him initially but soon after the publication of the book people start to get suspicious and in particular the famous English poet Alexander Pope begins to ridicule this he says it's, it's ridiculous it's a ridiculous play and it's not by Shakespeare and um, Theobald has forged it, and nobody should believe Theobald anyway. And gradually, the whole thing begins to become an embarrassment to Theobald. Not because he's forged it, but because he begins to believe that it is not by Shakespeare alone. It is probably by Shakespeare written collaboratively with John Fletcher. And once Theobald begins to feel that that is the case, he begins to feel less sure, and he starts to retreat. He sells the copyright of the play on, and he stops mentioning it. When he, start, when he publishes his complete 
edition of Shakespeare in 1734, he does not include the double falsehood. So double falsehood becomes something of uh, a curiosity, a curio. Scholars don't really mention it much in the 19th century. In the 20th century, people start to get a little bit interested in it, but on the whole, they just think, well, this is just an odd thing. We don't really understand this, and we don't believe that Shakespeare is in it. So in the 1980s, I started to work on Alexander Pope, and I became fascinated by Alexander Pope's account of this play in a famous poem that he wrote called The Dunciad. The Dunciad is a poem that makes fun of Louis Theobald. Instead of the Iliad, it's the Dunciad. The hero is a dunce, uh, an idiot. And that hero is Louis Theobald. So that, play, that poem makes a mockery of Theobald. But Pope is clearly very interested in double falsehood. He thinks it's ridiculous. He laughs at it. But then he also notices that, that some of the things published as prose in Theobald are actually blank verse, are iambic pentameter, you know? Da-dum, 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 da-dum. So all day long, the noise of battle rolled. It sounds like Pope starts looking at this and thinking, wait a minute, there is something here. And he, he publishes all that. But it doesn't make him think that behind the play, there is an older play. He doesn't come to that conclusion. However, I came to that conclusion. Uh, and as the years go on, we get towards the year 2000, 2001, 2002, people start to be much more receptive towards the collaborative Shakespeare. They start to want to know about Shakespeare as a collaborator. So the atmosphere gets much better for an edition like this one of double falsehood and the Arden Shakespeare editors approach me they, they they write to me and they say can you propose to us an edition of double falsehood could you persuade us that there is some Shakespeare in this and I think I think I can but it won't be easy but I think I, I, I can so I make a proposal to them they say well let's try it we're going to get a lot of flack because a lot of people don't believe this, so we're going to get an awful lot of trouble, uh, but let's do it. So the Arden Shakespeare decide that they are going to do the edition. Now, the question is, who wrote it? I've already said to you that I do not believe that Louis Theobald forged it. I've already said to you that behind the play there is an older play. And I think that that older play probably is the lost Shakespeare Fletcher Cardenio, but rewritten in the 17th century, probably by Betterton, and rewritten again in the 18th century by Theobald. So the play that we have, this play, and the play that Andre has brilliantly translated, that you can now read in Russian, this play, they, they are Louis Theobald's version of an older play which is itself a version of Shakespeare and Fletcher's Lost Cardenio. But I, I think that the text of this play contains Shakespeare's DNA. Let me put it, let me put it to you no, no more strongly than that. It contains Shakespeare's DNA and it contains a lot of Fletcher a lot of John Fletcher's original writing. Uh, now, how do we know this? How do we prove this? What is our evidence for this? Well, some of it you've already seen. Some of it is about the proving that the play still exists in, 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 in uh, physical form, in published form, throughout the 17th century and into Theobald's time. So some of the evidence I've already presented to you. Other parts of the evidence are based on stylistic analysis of the text. It, it's sometimes called stylometry, sometimes literary linguist, forms of literary linguistics, but there are ways of looking at the text and trying to determine how many different authors are in it on the basis of style. Uh, now, you, you're going to ask, what are these tests? 
Well, how, how do they do it? What, 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 what are the tests? And I can only give you a very, very brief account here of one or two of them. Um, but I might, because I'm in Russia, I think I will focus perhaps on the work of, of Marina Tarlinskaya. Marina Tarlinskaya is a literary linguist who works at the University of Washington uh, in, in uh, the USA. She's a very talented literary linguist, very talented indeed. Well, one of the people I needed to convince was Marina Tarlinskaya. I had to convince her. So she looked at the play and she used a whole series of uh, stylistic tests. Um, this is going to get a bit technical, but bear with me for a minute or two. She looked at the stress profile of the plays. What is stress profile? Well, uh, here's a line from Shakespeare. To be or not to be, that is the question. Where is the pause in that line? It's after not to, to be or not to be. It's, it's after syllable six. Syllable six. Five, six, because this is an 11 syllable line, so it's tricky. Syllable six. Tarlinskaya points out that Shakespeare always or usually stresses syllable six. Fletcher never stresses syllable six. Usually syllable eight. Theobald never stresses any syllable. Doesn't have a pause in the line. His lines go straight on. So if we can find lines that have the stress pattern in syllable six, others that have it in syllable eight, others that don't have it, we have some evidence that there are three different authors in the play. Now, because you may not be completely convinced yet, uh, let me give you another example. Shakespeare, if we look at the verb to have in English, to have, I, I have, you have, he has. In, in Shakespeare's day, that would have been he hath. But Fletcher, much younger man, more modern, he writes, he has. So, if this play has Shakespeare and Fletcher in it, we would expect hath in the Shakespeare bits and has in the Fletcher bits. And we do indeed find that pattern. And you could ask yourself, could a forger forge that in the 18th century? Would a forger have the nous to, to spot this? No. Modern literary you know, linguisticians with computer assistance, yes, they can see it. I don't think it would have been possible for anybody to see that in the 18th century. And anyway, there are lots of other reasons why I think Theobald is not a forger, which I can discuss in questions. So let me give you the, the verdict, shall I call it, of, of Tarlinskaya. This is what she says. Versification an analyses have confirmed that double falsehood contains few traces of Shakespeare's verse, but numerous signs of Fletcher's. Theobald did indeed use a 17th century early Jacobean text, and he adjusted its metrical style to the 18th century tastes. If it were a modern pastiche or counterfeit Shakespeare, its author would have implanted signs of later Shakespeare evenly throughout the text. The play would not contain scenes that resemble Fletcher. Enclitic phrases, heavy feminine endings, that's an interesting thing, feminine endings, and disyllabic I-O-N in Fletcher scenes would be too much to expect from a hoaxer. Okay, it's not the holy grail, because she finds just a few traces of Shakespeare's text. However, other stylisticians using different tests from hers have found much more Shakespeare in the play, particularly in Act 1 and 2. So here's the scene then. Shakespeare's getting tired, as I told you. He's thinking about retiring. He gets John Fletcher on board. He says, John, have you got a story for me? John says, I've got a great story for you. Cardenio from Double Falsehood. Let's write a play together. Good. I'll write the first bit. I'll get it started. I'll write Act 1, 
Acts and Act 2. You do the rest, John, because you're much better at plots than I am. Uh, and and we'll, let's, uh, you know, let's make it a, a good story, exciting, lots of interesting things happening. Let's make it a tragic comedy because Shakespeare is by now interested in tragic comedy. And uh, by that I mean plays that are not purely tragic and are not purely comic. Plays that have a mixed effect. Plays that make the audience uh, sad and happy and sad and happy in a kind of uh, roller coaster ride of emotion. And these are the plays that Shakespeare is writing in late career. And Cardenio is an example of, of a play like that. It's a tragic comedy based on a tragic comic story from Don Quixote. And so you have at least had a, a very small taste of the kind of discussion and evidence that the play provokes. Not everybody agrees with me, of course. I've had a fair bit of criticism from people, but this is a big country and we're big men, so that's fine. Uh, so in conclusion then, I just want to say that people ask me if I'm enjoying Moscow. And I, I tell them that I'm losing weight because it take, I lose 300 calories every time I put my coat on and off. So it's a great place to lose weight, I find. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks so much indeed for a wonderful lecture. Uh, I think we'll have uh, a little present for you. Here's a cat-like Pushkin, which I brought from uh, Mikhailovsk, uh, the place of his exile. <laughs> У нас сегодня в гостях переводчик, поэт, музыкант. Вообще-то, в принципе, по профессии ученый с фундаментальным образованием, который не предполагает того, что человек, который изучает, например, в последнее время стал еще и таксиркологом, да, как я понимаю, человек, который вращается в сфере точных наук, биология, химия, медицина вдруг обращается к текстам, которые являются, ну, скажем так, раритетами даже для любителей театралов Шекспира. Например, несколько лет назад он перевел Гамлета, но не того Гамлета, которого мы все знаем по Пастернаковским переводам или более современным, а по первой версии, первому кварту, первому варианту текста, который в два раза меньше, скорее всего, как э, говорит э, Алексей Барточевич, наверное, это был походный э, вариант, сокращенный для э, турне э, актерских труп. Но тем не менее, э, эта книга была, то есть это, этот перевод вышел сначала в журнале «Современная драматургия», а потом уже вот в нормальном таком вот виде в издательстве текст. Сейчас я предоставлю слово Андрея Кольчевского, давний наш знакомый и хороший друг. Я математик по образованию по кандидатской диссертации. Я биолог и, вот как Николай Владимирович сказал, токсиколог по профессии. Я живу в Соединенных Штатах Америки. Но вот, вот так получилось просто, что я... я так сказать, живу возможностью сохранять, сохранять связи с Россией. И вот эти связи, это связи через литературу, через театр. То, что я всегда любил больше всего. Мне просто повезло, что как бы, ну вот в мои руки попали эти несколько текстов, и я горжусь, что появилась вот эта книга. Она, появи... Она издана центром книги Рудомино, замечательным издательством, одним из лучших издательств России, Мы представим эту книгу на нон-фикшн буквально через несколько часов, поэтому мы так торопимся вместе с Брином. Это двуязычное издание, то есть это английский и русский вариант. Еще раз хочу подчеркнуть, это моя первая попытка подготовить русский перевод. И вот когда ты делаешь первый вариант, всем известно, что это как бы первый шаг. И поэтому, когда я смотрю на тех людей, которые присутствуют здесь сегодня, я думаю об ученых и переводчиках, которые, кто знает, может быть, будут причастны к тому, что будут подготовлены новые и, дай бог, лучшие переводы. 
Потому что всегда каждый последующий – это попытка шага вперед. Что здесь сидят будущие литературоведы и исследователи, которые будут способны прикоснуться к тем удивительным тайнам, о которых сегодня мы услышали от профессора Хэм. И тайны заключаются в том, что Шекспир, будучи универсальным общечеловеческим классиком, все равно остается загадкой, все равно в его наследии существуют пробелы, о которых мы знаем, что они существовали и существуют, но мы не знаем, будут ли они в действительности найдены и каким образом так сказать, найти отголоски и отражения этих работ в том, что нам доступно для исследования. Двойное вероломство, которое мы издали при поддержке Агентства по печати Российской Федерации, это в русском переводе, в билингвальном издании. Интересно, с моей точки зрения, в первую очередь тем, что это единственное на сегодняшний день свидетельство возможного, так сказать, э, э, тех возможных отголосков, тех возможных теней, которые остались от пьесы Шекспира, которая была по теме, от той самой истории Карденио, о которой сегодня э, Брин говорит. И вот это интересно. Главное, э, что мы практически уверены, что история Карденио существовала. И снова и снова я хочу подчеркнуть, может быть, через 30-40 лет нам удастся найти больше материала, и нам удастся увидеть и потом уже сравнить, что осталось в редакции Льюиса Теобальда. И вот так, как написано на обложке этой книги, написано «Двойное вероломство. Потерянная пьеса Уильяма Шекспира и Джона Флетчера под редакцией Льюиса Теобальда». Вот я думаю, это лучшая формулировка на сегодняшний день. А есть ли здесь Шекспир, его величие, его поэтический блеск, наверное, чувствуется очень отдаленно. Это все-таки проще, и тем не менее, вот еще раз хочу сказать, некие тени, некая ДНК, как Брин сказал, наверное, все-таки здесь присутствует. Если двойное вероломство в действительности некая переработка или адаптация истории Карденя, то это единственное существующее свидетельство заочного сотрудничества Шекспира и Сервантеса. Вот это уже что-то, так сказать, запредельное, потому что здесь уже начинают пересекаться настолько разные культуры, разные-разные слои. И это очень-очень интересно. И, конечно, мне было безумно интересно работать над этим текстом. И опять же, я очень надеюсь, что кто-то из вас впоследствии будет заниматься подобными вещами. Есть еще очень много вот этих сомнительных шекспировских вещей, которые на русский язык до сих пор не переведены. Нужны ли русские переводы, если мы не уверены, что это Шекспир? Ну, конечно, нужны. Как сказал Алексей Барташевич о двойном вероломстве, вот мы с ним списывались, а Барташевич, вы знаете это имя, это человек, который, так сказать, э, э, стоял у истоков и фактически является одним наиболее, из, из наиболее сильных шекспировских театроведов России. Барташевич сказал, да если даже там нет Шекспира вообще, но сама история вокруг этой пьесы настолько уникальна и интересна, что, конечно, это представляет собой исключительную важность чтобы Россия получила свой первый русский вариант этой пьесы. Конечно, очень многие в России могут читать английский текст, и это очень здорово и замечательно. Но вот очень хорошо, что у нас теперь есть какой-то, так сказать, и русское, в русском Шекспире добавилось вот это странное, необычное, а вместе с тем очень даже интересное двойное вероломство. История о том, как главный герой оставил свою возлюбленную на попечение близкого друга. А что потом получается, когда ты оставляешь возлюбленную на попечение близкого друга? Как раз вот здесь, в двойном вероломстве, это есть. А вот теперь спасибо вам большое, во-первых. Я вот сейчас влезаю в очередную вещь, к которой не имею профессионального отношения. 
потому что у меня нет ни одного класса музыкального образования, на самом деле. А я сейчас буду пытаться что-то изображать на, 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 на рояль. Вот мы вам покажем несколько песен. Эти песни в моем переводе на русский язык. И первая из них – это песня, которая звучала в 1727 году в постановке «Двойного вероломства». Это, книга, это песня из вот этой пьесы. А, практически известно, что вот этот текст, он написан не Шекспиром и не Флетчером. Это вариант Льюиса Теобальда, написанный специально для этой пьесы. Спасибо большое. А сейчас мы покажем вам еще две песни в моем переводе. И это, это будут две песни уже из совершенно другой пьесы. Это песни из шекспировской «Бури». И музыка к этим песням написана Робертом Джонсоном, тем самым э, шекспировским композитором, который у нас упоминается в «Двойном вероломстве», потому что по архивом Роберта Джонсона э, фактически были найдены некоторые дополнительные свидетельства об истории Карденио, то есть самой изначальной пьесы, на основе которой было сделано двойное вероломство. И вот сейчас два новых перевода двух песен Ариэля, и они звучат в, с той оригинальной музыкой, которая звучала уже с шекспировскими, э, в шекспировских пьесах. Thank you. 
Теперь, дорогие друзья, у нас есть возможность пообсуждать то, что вы услышали, задать несколько вопросов. By your talk about Shakespeare, and I can see that you are very interested in his uh, um, stories and uh, plays. But I would like to ask you uh, whether you uh, have any other ra ancient writers you are interested in aside from Shakespeare. I guess my my main interests are uh, in the slightly later than Shakespeare. They're in the 18th century. Um, I think the reason why they asked me to do this rather than one of the more established Shakespearean scholars is because this is mainly an 18th century story. It's an 18th century story going backwards. So anyone who is competent to do this has to be an 18th century person first and a Shakespearean second or a Renaissance person second. So a roundabout way of answering your question. But what, what I'm going to say is that I am now working on the, there is a complete Oxford University Press edition of the poems of Alexander Pope, and I'm doing a couple of the volumes of that. Um, uh, as far as more ancient writers are concerned, um, I, I've published now a lot on, on Cervantes. I've published a lot on the early history of the 18th century novel in England and how that owes a debt to Cervantes. So I, I, um, I'm, I'm popular in Spain because I have argued that Cervantes and Shakespeare were very closely linked and therefore the Spaniards love me. So last year I got invited to Spain a lot to talk about Cervantes and I'm, I'm becoming more and more and more interested in, in, in that. So that, that's some answer. Do you think that translations are important? So I understand that double falsehood are translated to two languages now, right? Or more. more you, can, you, can, you can tell us the story. Yeah. Why it's important? Generally, uh, is it for theater? Is it for reading? Is it for, uh, for something else? What is the rationale of the well, uh, I, I, translation I, I, to exist generally? In this particular case, the story is Shakespeare. As journalists would say, there are two big stories, Shakespeare and the Beatles. Shakespeare is uh, a big story wherever he, and, and, and if there is a story about some undiscovered pieces of Shakespeare, even if they are fragments, even if they are uh, deeply embedded in other things, as in this case, the world is going to be interested. It's therefore important that people should have the opportunity, although the tra in this case, uh, the translation makes it more difficult for them. I think they need to have the opportunity to assess what kind of, a, of, of an addition to the Shakespeare canon this is. And um, so this is perhaps not a general case of translation. The, the more general question about the importance of translation is, is one that you know, you, you're very skilled in, in answering. So, uh, but I think in this case, in this case, it is the Shakespeare story really. That, that, that generates the, the, the translations of, of it. And also, well, actually, my question would be more about the 18th century. I know that uh, there is a rivalry, there was a rivalry between the Pope edition of Shakespeare and the Theobald edition of Shakespeare. Indeed. And what do you think about the uh, Pope's conclusion on uh, the double falsehood in relation to those rivalries? Was he affected by it more than he was affected by the text itself? If, well, you've talked that uh, he somehow realized that there are some verse that still may be Shakespearean in nature. Mm. But was he, you know, affected by his business? Because, well, he was a very uh, bitter man. Yeah. And you also said that you would like that if there is a, well, there, if there would be an interest in elaborating what other parts of uh, double falsehood is in Donciad. And, uh, you know, can you comment on that a little bit? Yes. If we. Uh flashback to let's say the year 1725 Alexander Pope in that year has just finished producing an edition of Shakespeare uh, he has done this for the for the publisher Tonson whose name I mentioned in the lecture uh, uh, Tonson owns the rights to Shakespeare and has decided that Alexander Pope will be the editor of Shakespeare 
for the early 18th century. But Pope makes a mess of it. He decides that he doesn't like bits of Shakespeare, so he takes them out. He, for example, the porter scene in Macbeth doesn't like that, so he reduces that to a footnote. He um, decides to rewrite lines of Shakespeare because they are not metrically precise. He doesn't like 11 syllable lines, he prefers 10 syllable lines. Okay, let's rewrite that. So, Theobald, uh, Shakespeare's edition, uh, Pope's edition of Shakespeare is a very valuable commercial property. But along comes Louis Theobald in 1726, a young man, an aspiring new kid on the block, new Shakespeare scholar, and says, Pope's edition is terrible. And I will show you why. And he writes a, a whole book about Hamlet, about Pope's edition of Hamlet, which he shows to be a terrible mess. Pope has not looked at the early editions. Pope does not know much about Elizabethan grammar, or he does not know much about Elizabethan vocabulary. He hasn't done the work. So Theobald writes a very long book saying, Look, uh, uh, this is not the translation that we, uh, the, the, the edition that we need. And, and what he's doing by writing that is positioning himself to be the next editor. Everybody has to take notice of this. So there is indeed a commercial rivalry between Pope and Theobald. Uh, Pope's way of, Theobald in 1727 then says, I have a new Shakespeare play. Not only am I the greatest you know, Shakespeare scholar in the country, but I found a new play. And people are astonished and of course they say, Louis Theobald, has to be the next editor of Shakespeare. Pope responds by ridiculing Theobald. He responds by writing a comic poem, which we've mentioned, the Dunciad, in which uh, Theobald is ridiculed. And in particular, his play, The Double False, his claim to, be a, to have found a new play is thought to be ridiculous by Pope. And Pope needs to uh, uh, make that ridiculous because he needs to get Theobald out of the way as a commercial as a commercial rival and the reason why Pope is so savage about double falsehood is because he needs to get it out of the way it's it's, it's a threat to him it's a threat to him so he starts to rubbish it he picks lines out of it which he thinks are ridiculous and um, um, Shakespeare could have written but Fletcher of course could Fletcher could he overlooks that point and then, uh, and then uh, he starts to look hard at the play and starts to think, actually, there really is something here. But he's not in a position to admit that. And, and the reasons why I think, uh, with the background to what is happening, it seems to me, is commercial rivalry, essentially. Uh, it's, it's, it's marking out your territory, marking out your position as for Jacob Tonson's benefit. I am a fourth year student of International Relations Department mm -hmm. and I wanted to talk a bit about politics. <laughs> okay. So, as we already know, there was a Brexit referendum last year. Yes. And uh, if you took part, so it means that you voted. And yes. if you were asked to vote one year later, today, again, yeah. what would you do? Vote the same way or change your decision? And I voted uh, to remain part of the European Union. And I would vote again to remain part of the European Union. It seems to me that uh, the decision to go for Brexit is an act of national suicide. It appears to me that you could take a gun and shoot yourself in both feet, and it would be better than what we are doing now. Uh, for me, it is inconceivable that our economic prosperity uh, could be better outside of the trading block with which we do most of our trade. Mm -hmm. The idea that we can replace that trade with trade with India or Brazil, uh, just look at the geography. Yeah. It is absolutely crazy. The idea is crazy. And the reasons why it has happened are probably more interesting than the phenomenon itself. Uh, people often say that the uh, voting for Brexit has a lot in common with voting for Trump in America. 
And there is something to that analysis. You know, it needs to be qualified, but there, are, there is something in that. But certainly it, it seems to me that uh, uh, for our children's future, uh, I've, enjoyed, I've enjoyed a life of, of going to Europe. I like Europe. I can't see what's wrong with Europe. You know, people in, in, in European countries are very nice. People in this country are very nice. Why would one cut oneself off? from travel and become an island stuck out into, in the middle of the North Sea. You can see that I feel quite passionate about the subject. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your question. I'm a student of uh, international relationships. It is always interesting to find out something new about ancient literature and about ancient writers. So, and uh, I'd like to know your opinion about modern l literature. What do you think about it? Does it exist? I, I, I think, you know, um, in Shakespeare's period, we have probably only got about one, th one third of the plays that were written and performed have survived. Two thirds, m more has been lost than has uh, survived. In some ways, part of the Shakespeare phenomenon is a question of survival, of what has survived, of what we have. Shakespeare is a writer who seems to be able to be interpreted differently at different times, in different historical periods, in different cultures, and therefore I think that's a, that's a reason for calling him a great writer. Uh, we've got some three or four hundred years of, 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 of hindsight, so we can establish where Shakespeare is. Modern literature is going to take longer. It's going to take time for people to look back at it and see what stands the test of time, as it were. Uh, I think at the time when you read, take James Joyce's Ulysses, for example. When people first read James Joyce's Ulysses, they could make nothing of it. They didn't understand it. It seemed to break all the rules of, 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 of novel writing. Uh, it, was, it was playful. It was, it was doing things with language that had never been done. So initially, the reaction to it was mixed. Some people hated it. Lots of people hated it. It's taken 50, 60, 100 years for us to see it as a masterpiece. But surely it is a masterpiece. Surely it is a masterpiece. And, uh, so the idea that we are not producing masterpieces now can't be. We must be producing masterpieces now, but we will see them in 50 years. We'll see them in 50 years' time. Do you just? What do you think yourself? I agree with you that uh, we uh, value, we appreciate, um, we appreciate, uh, uh, we will appreciate uh, uh, literature. Uh, which uh, is writing uh, right now, uh, only uh, only after uh, some years, because uh, it always happen. Uh, it always happens because uh, we uh, tr uh, we start uh, value some things which uh, we uh, didn't value before, uh, which we hadn't valued before, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, start to understand. Uh, we started understanding that uh, it was great and uh, it was mag magnificent. Uh, and uh, when uh, in modern writers uh, start uh, um, start making their uh, their uh, new start, start writing their new books. Uh, there are a lot of opinions and a lot of people who, do, uh, who don't understand it, uh, and uh, uh, they will understand it only uh, only after some years. This is a play which, uh, when it first came out in the 1950s, was again astonishing. Broke ev every rule there was of playwriting. Part, one of the things that it did was to show that you can write plays with very few words. You don't need a lot of words. You can, you know, plays can be written out of very minimalist uh, for linguistic forms. Uh, but at the time, of course, people were completely confused by it. Couldn't understand it. Is it sad? Is it happy? Is it a comedy? Is it a tragedy? Should we laugh? Should we cry? I don't know. But now, of course, we've settled down. That's an established part of the canon. It is a masterpiece. 
And part of the reason why is because it plays with genre, it plays with comedy and tragedy. Anyway, this is just another example of the way the time sorts out the question of you know, literary significance and the masterpiece question that you ask. Because contemporaries of Shakespeare uh, didn't, uh, uh, and uh, not all of them uh, understood, uh, understood uh, his, um, his poems. Uh, no, any? not certainly not. And it happens all the time. It depends on time and variety of uh, opinions. Yes. Good. We've answered that one between us. Excellent. Thank you for an answer. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I've got a question to all of you. Uh, as far as I remember, Doubles Hood uh, Fault was staged in the 21st century twice or thrice, uh, for instance, by Royal Shakespeare Company. Uh, as Cardenia, uh, the lost Shakespeare reimagined, That's right. and, and in New Jersey is yeah. uh, Cardenia, the lost Shakespeare, something like that. Mm. Uh, so, to my, in my opinion, uh, like directors actually in these cases refer to Shakespeare and Cervantes only, not Fletcher. Uh, do you think that any other uh, plays by Fletcher, Messenger, or other Shakespeare's contemporaries can be stage-worthy uh, and uh, interesting for theatre goers nowadays? For example, to give one, Gary Taylor, uh, the eminent Shakespeare scholar who is actually one of the main editors of the New Oxford Shakespeare, Gary Taylor maybe five years ago, six years ago, published a massive edition of the plays of Thomas Middleton. And in that edition, uh, and in subsequent lectures around the world, Gary Taylor made the case that Thomas Middleton is at least as great a playwright as Shakespeare. At least as great. In, ta in Taylor's view, which would not be widely shared, I think, um, he thinks that Thomas Middleton is a greater playwright than Shakespeare. Thomas Middleton's plays are certainly wonderful in the theater. And so are John Fletcher's. John Fletcher tells a good story. He tells a rattling good yarn. Lots of things happen in John Fletcher plays. He doesn't have that metaphorical density of, of language that Shakespeare has. He hasn't got the kinds of things that we, that we value Shakespeare for soliloquy, meditation, thick, thick uh, metaphorical density. That's not in Fletcher. Fletcher wants to get on with the story, but he, he is a very good theatrical writer. Um, Middleton, I think, is great in the theater. Massinger, not so much. There's a couple of Massinger plays, like the Roman actor that I think is, and, and the Royal Shakespeare Company does do these plays. I mean, they have uh, an auditorium, the Swan Theater, where they do uh, lots of plays of the contemporaries, and then Ben Johnson. Think of think of the richness you've got in Ben Johnson. So I can only say that you know there are lots and lots and lots of, of great playwrights from that period, and the case has been suggested that Shakespeare may not be the greatest of them. Но я думаю, что это был последний вопрос, поскольку у нас есть обещание, не обещание, и даже не обязательство, но есть желание послушать еще э, исполнение нескольких, наверное, пьес, да, Андру, одной, да, Андрей Кольческого. Я хочу вам показать свою песню на текст, на мой перевод из первого кварта Гамлета, Шекспира. Я не композитор профессиональный, но так тоже вот выпало в жизни, что э, э, ну, какое-то количество песен и музыки было написано за эти годы. Сегодня упоминался Орск, Орск, кстати сказать. Э, в Орске в Народном театре «Встреча» до сих пор идет пьеса «Беда от нежного сердца» с моей музыкой. Вот это очень удивительно, мне очень хотелось бы поехать и послушать. Я их никогда не слышал, но я знаю, что... «Беда от нежного сердца» идет с музыкой Андрея Корчевского. Я недавно разговаривал с их режиссером, это очень интересно. А начиналось это все в Павлодаре, где впервые было 
была поставлена «Беда от нежного сердца» с моей музыкой. Ну, а вот эта песня «Могильщика», надеюсь, что это не будет слишком грустно для завершения вечера. Песня «Могильщика» из «Гамлета» в моем переводе и с моей скромной музыкой. Красотку видит Бог, И время у нее в гостях Ни с чем сравнить не мог. Но время с поступью стальной Мой охладило пыл, Чтоб вновь меня вернуть во прах, Откуда взят я был. Читой лопат, лопат, теперь средь бела дня Свою постель послать хотят для гостя, для меня. Читой лопат, лопат, теперь средь бела дня Свою постель послать хотят для гостя, для меня. На самом деле, как раз сегодня звучали слова о трагикомедии, о том, что Шекспир в последние годы был обращен именно к этому жанру, к фантастическим комедиям, в том числе и к трагикомедии. Поэтому это вся жизнь, это весь Шекспир, который весь перемешан и весь соткан из смешного, горького, из радостного и такого, как, как, какова жизнь сама. So, I want to thank you so much for an incredible lecture. Um, I hope we will meet again, not within seven years since we last met That's in Stratford upon the way one yeah. back in uh, 2010. Yeah. So um, uh, I think everybody will enjoy it and I think we'll all you know, some um, cheer up, um, applaud to Ms. Thank you. That's very nice. Hammond. Thank you very much. Спасибо всем.